Mm-hmm. Good evening, kids. <sighs> what is our lot to be this weird night? Are we allowed to tag friends? Facebook says, once again, no results found. If anyone can tell me how to remedy this, it would be appreciated. In the meantime, I guess what I must do is tag you all after the fact for some solitary reading. But, um, we'll make do. One thing a person might need in order to undertake such a thing as reading is the book. If you'll bear with me for a moment. Yeah, so weird fiction lovers. Good evening. We've got just this and one more installment of The House on the Borderland by William Hope Hodgson. Uh, from there, I've got, got some special stuff in store for you, I believe. Um, also, if you're enjoying this, you might actually enjoy the lighter fare that I offer in the mornings. George MacDonald, around 7 a.m. or so, Eastern Standard Time. Um, very thoughtful fairy tales with a weird and sometimes dark bent. Um, a lot of humanity and humor in there. Very different from this, and yet um, not so far. All right, William Hope Hodgson's The House on the Borderland. This is our ninth installment. Um, tomorrow night we'll finish this up and move on into some other proto-weird, some shorter tales. I don't want to do ten installments again right away. Um, some, some shorter weird fiction, and uh, we shall see what we shall see. William Hope Hodgson's The House on the Borderland, Chapter 21, The Dark Sun. How long our souls lay in the arms of joy, I cannot say. But all at once I was waked from my happiness by a diminution of the pale and gentle light that lit the sea of sleep. I turned toward the huge white orb with a premonition of coming trouble. One side of it was curved inward as though a convex black shadow were sweeping across it. My memory went back. It was thus that the darkness had come before our last parting. I turned toward my love inquiringly. With a sudden knowledge of woe, I noticed how wan and unreal she had grown, even in that brief space. Her voice seemed to come to me from a distance. The touch of her hands was no more than the gentle pressure of a summer wind and grew less perceptible. Already, quite half of the immense globe was shrouded. A feeling of desperation seized me. Was she about to leave me? Would she have to go as she had gone before? I questioned her anxiously, frightenedly, and she, nestling closer, explained in that strange, faraway voice that it was imperative she should leave me before the sun of darkness, as she termed it, blotted out the light. At this confirmation of my fears, I was overcome with despair, and could only look voicelessly across the quiet plains of the silent sea. How swiftly the darkness spread across the face of the white orb. Yet in reality, the time must have been long beyond human comprehension. At last, only a crescent of pale fire lit the now dim sea of sleep. All this while, she had held me but with so soft a caress that I had been scarcely conscious of it. We waited there, together, she and I, speechless, for very sorrow. In the dimmest, or in the dimming light, her face showed shadowy, blending into the dusky mistiness that encircled us. Then, when a thin, curved line of soft light was all that lit the sea, she released me, pushing me from her tenderly. Her voice sounded in my ears, I may not stay longer, dear one. It ended in a sob. She seemed to float away from me and became invisible. Her voice came to me out of the shadows, faintly, apparently from a great distance. A little while, it died away 
remotely. In a breath, the sea of sleep darkened into night. Far to my left, I seemed to see for a brief instant a soft glow. It vanished, and in the same moment I became aware that I was no longer above the still sea, but once more suspended in infinite space, with the green sun now eclipsed by a vast, dark sphere before me. Utterly bewildered, I stared, almost unseeingly, at the ring of green flames leaping above the dark edge. Even in the chaos of my thoughts, I wondered dully at their extraordinary shapes. A multitude of questions assailed me. I thought more of her I had seen, I had so lately seen than of the sight before me. My grief and thoughts of the future filled me. Was I doomed to be separated from her always? Even in the old earth days, she had been mine only for a little while. Then she had left me, as I thought, forever. Since then, I had seen her but these times upon the sea of sleep. A feeling of fierce resentment filled me, and miserable questionings. Why could I not have gone with my love? What reason to keep us apart? Why had I to wait alone while she slumbered through the years on the still bosom of the sea of the sleep? The sea of sleep. My thoughts turned inconsequently out of their channel of bitterness to fresh, desperate questionings. Where was it? Where was it? I seemed to have put to have but just parted from my love upon its quiet surface, and it had gone, utterly. It could not be far away, and the white orb which I had seen hidden in the shadow of the sun of darkness, my sight dwelt upon the green sun eclipsed. What had eclipsed it? Was there a vast dead star circling it? Was the central sun, as I had come to regard it, a double star? The thought had come almost unbidden. Yet why should it not be so? My thoughts went back to the white orb. Strange that it should have been. I stopped. An idea had come suddenly. The white orb and the green sun. Were they one and the same? My imagination wandered backward, and I remembered the luminous globe to which I had been so unaccountably attracted. It was curious that I should have forgotten it even momentarily. Where were the others? I reverted again to the globe I had entered. I thought for a time, and matters became clearer. I conceived that by entering that impalpable globule, I had passed at once into some further, and until then, invisible dimension. There the green sun was still visible, but as a stupendous sphere of pale white light, almost as though its ghost showed, and not its material part. A long time I mused on the subject. I remembered how, on entering the sphere, I had immediately lost all sight of the others. For a still further period, I continued to revolve the different details in my mind. In a while, my thoughts turned to other things. I came more into the present and began to look about me seeingly. For the first time, I perceived that innumerable rays of a subtle violet hue pierced the strange semi-darkness in all directions. They radiated from the fiery rim of the green sun. They seemed to grow upon my vision so that in a little I saw that they were countless. The night was filled with them, spreading outward from the green sun, fanwise. I concluded that I was enabled to see them by reason of the sun's glory being cut off by the eclipse. They reached right out into space and vanished. Gradually, as I looked, I became aware that fine points of intensely bright light traversed the rays. Many of them seemed to travel from the green sun into distance. Others came out of the void toward the sun, but one and all each kept strictly to the ray in which it traveled. Their speed was inconceivably great, and it was only when they neared the green sun, or as they left it, that I could see them as separate specks of light. Further from the sun, they became thin lines of vivid fire within the violet. The discovery of these rays and the moving sparks interested me extraordinarily. To where did they lead? In such countless profusion? I thought of the worlds in space and those sparks, messengers. Possibly the idea was fantastic, but I was not conscious of it being so. Messengers, messengers from the central sun. 
an idea evolved itself slowly. Was the green sun the abode of some vast intelligence? The thought was bewildering, visions of the unnameable rose, vaguely. Had I indeed come upon the dwelling place of the eternal? For a time I repelled the thought dumbly. It was too stupendous, yet huge, vague thoughts had birth within me. I felt suddenly terribly naked, and an awful nearness shook me. And heaven? Was that an illusion? My thoughts came and went erratically, the sea of sleep, and she, heaven, I came back with a bound to the present. Somewhere out of the void behind me there rushed an immense dark body, huge and silent. It was a dead star, hurling onward to the burying place of stars. It drove between me and the central suns, blotting them out from my vision and plunging me into an impenetrable night. An age, and I saw again the violet rays. A great while later, Aeons it may have been, a circular glow grew in the sky ahead, and I saw the edge of the receding star show darkly against it. Thus I knew that it was nearing the central suns. Presently I saw the bright ring of the green sun show plainly against the night. The star had passed into the shadow of the dead sun. After that I just waited. The strange years went slowly, and ever I watched intently. The thing I had expected came at last, suddenly, awfully, a vast flare of dazzling light, a streaming burst of white flame across the dark void. For an indefinite while, it soared outward, a gigantic mushroom of fire. It ceased to grow, then as time went by, it began to sink backward slowly. I saw now that it came from a huge glowing spot near the center of the dark sun. Mighty flames still soared outward from this, yet, spite of its size, the grave of the star was no more than the shining of Jupiter upon the face of an ocean, when compared with the inconceivable mass of the dead sun. I may remark here, once more, that no words will ever convey to the imagination the enormous bulk of the two central suns. Chapter 22, The Dark Nebula Years melted into the past. Centuries, aeons. The light of the incandescent star sank to a furious red. It was later that I saw the dark nebula, at first an impalpable cloud away to my right. It grew steadily to a clot of blackness in the night. How long I watched it is impossible to say for time as we count it was a thing of the past. It came closer, a shapeless monstrosity of darkness, tremendous. It seemed to slip across the night sleepily, a very hell fog. Slowly it slid nearer and passed into the void between me and the central suns. It was as though a curtain had been drawn before my vision. A strange tremor of fear took me, and a fresh sense of wonder. The green twilight that had reigned for so many millions of years had now given place to impenetrable gloom. Motionless, I peered about me. A century fled, and it seemed to me that I detected occasional dull glows of red passing me at intervals. Earnestly, I gazed and presently seemed to see circular masses that showed muddily red within the clouded blackness. They appeared to be growing out of the nebulous murk. A while, and they became plainer to my accustomed vision. I could see them now with a fair amount of distinctness, ruddy-tinged spheres, similar in size to the luminous globes that I had seen so long previously. They floated past me, continually. Gradually, a peculiar uneasiness seized me. I became aware of a growing feeling of repugnance and dread. It was directed against those passing orbs, and seemed born of intuitive knowledge rather than of any real cause or reason. Some of the passing globes were brighter than others, and it was from one of these that a face looked 
suddenly. A face, human in its outline, but so tortured with woe that I stared, aghast. I had not thought there was such sorrow as I saw there. I was conscious of an added sense of pain on perceiving that the eyes which glared so wildly were sightless. A while longer I saw it, then it had passed on into the surrounding gloom. After this, I saw others, all wearing that look of hopeless sorrow, and blind. A long time went by, and I became aware that I was nearer to the orbs than I had been. At this I grew uneasy, though I was less in fear of those strange globules than I had been before seeing their sorrowful inhabitants, for sympathy had tempered my fear. Later there was no doubt but that I was being carried closer to the red spheres, and presently I floated among them. In a while I perceived one bearing down upon me. I was helpless to move from its path. In a minute, it seemed, it was upon me, and I was submerged in a deep red mist. This cleared, and I stared confusedly across the immense breadth of the Plain of Silence. It appeared just as I had first seen it. I was moving forward steadily across its surface. Away ahead shone the vast blood-red ring that lit the place. All around was spread the extraordinary desolation of stillness that had so impressed me during my previous wanderings across its starkness. Presently I saw, rising up into the ruddy gloom, the distant peaks of the mighty amphitheater of mountains, where untold ages before I had been shown my first glimpse of the terrors that underlie many things, and where, vast and silent, watched by a thousand mute gods, stands the replica of this house of mysteries, this house that I had seen swallowed up in that hellfire ere the earth had kissed the sun and vanished forever. Though I could see the crests of the mountain amphitheater, yet it was a great while before their lower portions became visible. Possibly this was due to the strange, ruddy haze that seemed to cling to the surface of the plain. However, be this as it may, I saw them at last. In a still further space of time, I had come so close to the mountains that they appeared to overhang me. Presently, I saw the great rift open before me, and I drifted into it, without volition on my part. Later, I came out upon the breadth of the enormous arena, there, at an apparent distance of some five miles, stood the house, huge, monstrous, and silent, lying in the very center of that stupendous amphitheater. So far as I could see, it had not altered in any way, but looked as though it were only yesterday that I had seen it. Around, the grim, dark mountains frowned down upon me from their lofty silences. Far to my right, Away up among inaccessible peaks loomed the enormous bulk of the great beast god. Higher, I saw the hideous form of the dread goddess rising up through the red gloom, thousands of fathoms above me. To the left, I made out the monstrous eyeless thing, gray and inscrutable. Further off, reclining on its lofty ledge, the livid ghoul shape showed a splash of sinister color among the dark mountains. Slowly, I moved out across the great arena, floating. As I went, I made out the dim forms of many of the other lurking horrors that peopled those supreme heights. Gradually, I neared the house, and my thoughts flashed back across the abyss of years. I remembered the dread specter of the place. A short while passed, and I saw that I was being wafted directly toward the enormous mass of that silent building. About this time I became aware in an indifferent sort of way of a growing sense of numbness that robbed me of the fear which I should otherwise have felt on approaching that awesome pile. As it was, I viewed it calmly, much as a man views calamity through the haze of his tobacco smoke. In a little while I had come so close to the house as to be able to distinguish many of the details about it, the longer I looked, the more was I confirmed in my long-ago impressions of its entire similitude to this strange house. Save in its enormous size, 
I could find nothing unlike. Suddenly, as I stared, a great feeling of amazement filled me. I had come opposite to that part where the outer door leading into the study is situated. There, lying right across the threshold, lay a great length of coping stone identical save in size and color with the piece I had dislodged in my fight with the pit creatures. I floated nearer, and my astonishment increased as I noted that the door was broken partly from its hinges precisely in the manner that my study door had been forced inward by the assaults of the swine things. The sight started a train of thoughts, and I began to race dimly, began to trace dimly that the attack on this house might have a far deeper significance than I had hitherto imagined. I remembered how, long ago, in the old earth days, I had half suspected that in some unexplainable manner this house in which I live was en rapport, to use a recognized term, with that other tremendous structure away in the midst of that incomparable plain. Now, however, it began to be borne upon me that I had but vaguely conceived what the realization of my suspicion meant. I began to understand, with a more than human clearness, that the attack I had repelled was in some extraordinary manner connected with an attack upon that strange edifice. With a curious inconsequence, my thoughts abruptly left the matter to dwell wonderingly upon the peculiar material out of which the house was constructed. It was, as I have mentioned earlier, of a deep green color. Yet now that I had come so close to it, I perceived that it fluctuated at times, though slightly, glowing and fading, much as do the fumes of phosphorus when rubbed upon the hand in the dark. Presently, my attention was distracted from this by coming to the great entrance. Here, for the first time, I was afraid, for all in a moment the huge doors swung back, and I drifted in between them helplessly. Inside, all was blackness, impalpable. In an instant, I had crossed the threshold, and the great doors closed silently, shutting me in that lightless place. For a while I seemed to hang motionless, suspended amid the darkness. Then I became conscious that I was moving again, where I could not tell. Suddenly, far down beneath me, I seemed to hear a murmurous noise of swine laughter. It sank away, and the succeeding silence appeared clogged with horror. Then a door opened somewhere ahead, a white haze of light filtered through, and I floated slowly into a room that seemed strangely familiar. All at once, there came a bewildering, screaming noise that deafened me. I saw a blurred vista of visions flaming before my sight. My senses were dazed through the space of an eternal moment. Then my power of seeing came back to me. The dizzy, hazy feeling passed, and I saw Clearly. Chapter 23. Pepper. I was seated in my chair, back again in this old study. My glance wandered round the room. For a minute it had a strange, quivery appearance, unreal and unsubstantial. This disappeared, and I saw that nothing was altered in any way. I looked toward the end window. The blind was up. I rose to my feet, shakily. As I did so, a slight noise in the direction of the door attracted my attention. I glanced toward it. For a short instant, it appeared to me that it was being closed gently. I stared and saw that I must have been mistaken. It seemed closely shut. With a succession of efforts, I trod my way to the window and looked out. The sun was just rising, lighting up the tangled wilderness of gardens. For perhaps a minute I stood and stared. I passed my hand confusedly across my forehead. Presently, amid the chaos of my senses, a sudden thought came to me. I turned quickly and called to Pepper. There was no answer, and I stumbled across the room in a quick access of fear. 
As I went, I tried to frame his name, but my lips were numb. I reached the table and stooped down to him with a catching at my heart. He was lying in the shadow of the table, and I had not been able to see him distinctly from the window. Now, as I stooped, I took my breath shortly. There was no pepper. Instead, I was reaching toward an elongated little heap of gray, ash-like dust. I must have remained in that half-stooped position for some minutes. I was dazed, stunned. Pepper had really passed into the land of the shadows. Chapter 24 The Footsteps in the Garden Pepper is dead. Even now, at times, I seem scarcely able to realize that this is so. It is many weeks since I came back from that strange and terrible journey through space and time. Sometimes in my sleep I dream about it, and I go through in imagination the whole of that fearsome happening. When I awake, my thoughts dwell upon it. That sun, those suns, were they indeed the great central suns round which the whole universe of the, known heaven, of the unknown heavens revolves? Who shall say? and the bright globules floating forever in the light of the green sun, and the sea of sleep on which they float. How unbelievable it all is! If it were not for Pepper, I should, even after the many extraordinary things that I have witnessed, be inclined to imagine that it was but a gigantic dream. Then there is that dreadful dark nebula with its multitudes of red spheres, moving always within the shadow of the dark sun, sweeping along on its stupendous orbit, wrapped eternally in gloom. And the faces that peered out at me, God, do they, and does such a thing really exist? There is still that little heap of gray ash on my study floor. I will not have it touched. At times, when I am calmer, I have wondered what became of the outer planets of the solar system. It has occurred to me that they may have broken loose from the sun's attraction and whirled away into space. This is, of course, only a surmise. There are so many things about which I wonder. Now that I am writing, let me record that I am certain there is something horrible about to happen. Last night a thing occurred which has filled me with an even greater terror than did the pit fear. I will write it down now and if anything more happens, endeavor to make a note of it at once. I have a feeling that there is more in this last affair than in all those others. I am shaky and nervous even now as I write. Somehow I think death is not very far away. Not that I fear death, as death is understood, yet there is that in the air which bids me fear, an intangible cold horror. I felt it last night. It was thus. Last night, I was sitting here in my study, writing. The door leading into the garden was half open. At times, the metallic rattle of a dog's chain sounded faintly. It belongs to the dog I have bought since Pepper's death. I will not have him in the house, not after Pepper. Still, I have felt it better to have a dog about the place. They are wonderful creatures. I was much engrossed in my work, and the time passed quickly. Suddenly, I heard a soft noise on the path outside in the garden. Pad, 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 it went with a stealthy, curious sound. I sat upright with a quick movement and looked out through the open door. Again, the noise came. Pad, pad, pad. It appeared to be approaching. With a slight feeling of nervousness, I stared into the gardens, but the night hid everything. Then the dog gave a long howl, and I started. For a minute, perhaps, I peered intently, but could hear nothing. After a little, I picked up the pen which I had laid down and recommenced my work. The nervous feeling had gone, for I imagined that the sound I had heard was nothing more than the dog walking round his kennel at the length of his chain. A quarter of an hour may have passed, then all at once the dog howled again and with such a plaintively sorrowful note that I jumped to my feet, dropping my pen and inking the page on which I was at work. Curse that dog, I muttered, noting what I had done. Then, even as I said the words, there sounded again that queer pad, pad, pad. It was horribly close, 
almost by the door, I thought. I knew now that it could not be the dog. His chain would not allow him to come so near. The dog's growl came again, and I noted subconsciously the taint of fear in it. Outside, on the window sill, I could see Tip, my sister's pet cat. As I looked, it sprang to its feet, its tail swelling visibly. For an instant it stood thus, seeming to stare fixedly at something in the direction of the door. Then, quickly, it began to back along the sill, until reaching the wall at the end it could go no further. There it stood, rigid, as though frozen in an attitude of extraordinary terror. Frightened and puzzled, I seized a stick from the corner and went toward the door silently. Taking one of the candles with me, I had come to within a few paces of it when suddenly a peculiar sense of fear thrilled through me, a fear palpitant and real, whence I knew not nor why. So, so great was the feeling of terror that I wasted no time, but retreated straight away, walking backward and keeping my gaze fearfully on the door. I would have given much to rush at it, fling it to, and shoot the bolts, for I have had it repaired and strengthened, so that now it is far stronger than ever it has been. Like Tip, I continued my almost unconscious progress backward, until the wall brought me up. At that, I started nervously and glanced round apprehensively. As I did so, my eyes dwelt momentarily on the rack of firearms, and I took a step toward them, but stopped, with a curious feeling that they would be needless. Outside in the gardens, the dog moaned strangely. Suddenly, from the cat, there came a fierce, long screech. I glanced jerkily in its direction. Something luminous and ghostly encircled it and grew upon my vision. It resolved into a glowing hand, transparent, with a lambent greenish flame flickering over it. The cat gave a last awful caterwaul, and I saw it smoke and blaze. My breath came with a gasp, and I leant against the wall. Over that part of the window there spread a smudge, green and fantastic. It hid the thing from me, though the glare of fire shone through dully. A stench of burning stole into the room. Pad, pad, pad. Something passed down the garden path, and a faint, moldy odor seemed to come in through the open door and mingle with the burnt smell. The dog had been silent for a few moments. Now I heard him yowl sharply, as though in pain. Then he was quiet, save for an occasional subdued whimper of fear. A minute went by. Then the gate on the west end, on the west side of the garden, slammed distantly. After that, nothing, not even the dog's whine. I must have stood there some minutes. Then a fragment of courage stole into my heart, and I made a frightened rush at the door, dashed it to, and bolted it. After that, for a full half hour, I sat helpless, staring before me rigidly. Slowly, my life came back into me, and I made my way, shakily, upstairs to bed. That is all. Tomorrow night at ten, conclusion of William Hope Hodgson's House on the Borderland. Um, we've got chapter 25, The Thing from the Arena up next. Be well, be weird, be kind to one another.